Oh, that one. Oh. You know, your ears getting sore. Oh. Poor lad. <laughs> oh, dear. Jesse says she emailed you, but there's no Zoom on Friday. I don't know if you got that email. Or where they were. I don't know when she emailed, she just texted me. So. Yeah, I guess they will take next quarter and tomorrow. have gathered in the presence of Jesus, who witnesses to the God who has given us life and every good gift and makes it open truth that our cups indeed do f overflow if we but have an open heart to perceive that. I'm glad you've joined us this morning, those of you in person and those of you at home, as we give thanks to the Lord and worship the God who is our center. Please rise now for the call to worship. We have gathered in the name of Jesus, our crucified and risen Lord. Thanks be to God. With thankful hearts, we pause this day to be reminded of our grandest hope that the calamities, the demands,
The blessings of this world do not have the last word. Lord Jesus, you are the one who was and is, and who is yet to come, a ruler of a different kind. Open our hearts to the comfort, the challenge, and the mystery of this good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, your faithful witness, we pray. Amen. And so let us sing our thanksgivings with our opening hymn number uh, 694, but uh, has no relevance to you. Come, ye thankful people, come. gathered in the name of Jesus, the one who has been victorious over all the powers of death and darkness that assault us in the course of our lives. No matter the ways in which you have been in bondage, you have stumbled this past week, this is a new beginning. We witness together to a love that is deeper, wider, broader than anything that can keep us from knowing that we belong to God. You are God's beloved children, cherished in the places prepared for you in God's kingdom. So let us lift up our voices now in thanksgiving and sing the song of Alleluia. deepest peace comes from Christ, the gift given to us that enters into the deep regions of our hearts, that takes down the walls that separate us from God, from one another, from our truest self. Let's claim the gift of Christ's peace. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Amen. You may be seated. And we are going to be blessed now with a song to the glory of God and to our comfort by our own Connie Keller. Okay.
Are your kids okay? Will they come home safe? Do you lie there hoping? You can make a wish. You can knock on wood. Oh, it won't do no good. You gotta get down. Thank you, Connie, for the nudge to uh, come back home. So, Melania, hi, how are you? Nice to see you. So glad you're here. This is our children's time for Melania and for those of you who are home, kids. So I've been thinking about what it means to say, my cup runneth over, it's in the 23rd Psalm. Well, it means to recognize that you have been blessed to overflowing. And there's a story I've been thinking about in relation to that, and it involves people who back in Jesus' day suffered from leprosy. Do you know what leprosy is? Well, leprosy is a skin disease that can be very painful and it's contagious. And in Jesus' day, when somebody came down with it, well, they had to leave their home leave their job if they had one. They had to go outside of the village where they lived, away from all the people that they loved, and live outside on the boundary. And there they would survive by begging. And people would give them gifts of, of food to keep them from starving. And one time, when Jesus was passing down a road that separated the people of Samaria and the people of Judea, who hated each other, he came across a group of ten lepers who were living in a little community together. And that's interesting because they hated each other, but here they seem to be loving each other, at least caring for each other. And they begged, they called out to Jesus, have mercy on us. Maybe they were asking for food. Or maybe they were asking for healing. But Jesus said, go show yourself to the priests, which is what they would need to do if they were going to be made well and get a certificate from the priest that says, hey, I'm well, I can come back. And they went. And as they went, they discovered that they were no longer suffering from leprosy. Their skin had gotten all clean and the pain went away. And Jesus, there was only one of the ten who decided, 
I got to give thanks. I'm blessed. I've been healed. And he was a Samaritan, not a Jew like Jesus. And he came down and fell before Jesus, as you see here, and gave him thanks. While the other nine went on to the priest. Interesting story. And Jesus says to the man, he says, where are the other nine? How come you're the only one to come? And no answer. Come on, we're left with that question. Um, and Jesus says to the man, go in peace. Your faith has made you well. Which is interesting. It's like you're not truly well until you have a grateful heart. Until you know that your cup runneth over. So, why didn't the other nine who got healed feel thankful, at least enough, in order to come back? And what keeps you and I from feeling thankful? Interesting question to reflect on. There are all kinds of answers, but I have a notion why maybe those nine didn't come back. And that had to do with the fact that now, now that they had their bodies healed, and their skin clean, they didn't have to live out on the edge of the village begging, but they had important stuff to deal with, like the people they left behind. I gotta go see them, or am I still welcome at home? And how am I gonna make a living now that I'm not allowed to just sit and beg on this out there? In other words, they had problems to deal with. Do any of you have problems? <laughs> Interesting thing about problems, right? There always are problems. No end to problems. And the thing about problems, you get one solved. Like, say you're sick with leprosy. You got a whole host of other problems you can focus on. And there's something about that in us, right? That we... Okay, I got this problem taken care of, but there's now these other problems. And we keep on, keep on worrying, worrying, worrying about the problems. Jesus said, do not be anxious about tomorrow, but let tomorrow be anxious for itself. Just seek ye first the kingdom of God and your righteousness. There's a difference between what we want, what we really want to happen, and what we need. And all we really need in the moment is the grace of God and God's love and daily bread, that's all we really need. And sometimes we can be unwilling to share what we've been given because we're so anxious. Will I have enough for tomorrow with those problems that will be waiting for me? And it leads to us tightening up our heart, tightening up our heart, and caring only for ourselves and worrying, worrying. And we're not really whole when that happens. We're not really well until our hearts get made well when we become grateful. So, this week, Melania, what's happening this week? Would it be maybe Thanksgiving? Yes! Thank you, Melania. It's the, it's the celebration of Thanksgiving. And it first began when, when people gave thanks for the harvest. After working in the fields, uh, the soil, and, and the, the harvest would come, and they, we've got enough food now to carry us through the winter. And they recognized that they didn't make the sun shine, and they didn't make the rain fall, and they didn't make the soil. That the harvest was a blessing from God, and they needed to stop, stop and give thanks. So this week, let's all stop our hurrying and give thanks and think about all the things we take for granted and all the reasons we have to give thanks. And that's why we always say at the end of our children's time, there's always room in the circle. It's time for us to pray. Melania, got anybody you want to pray for today? Baby Luca. Baby Luca's not feeling well? Okay, let's pray for Baby Luca. Let's all pray together. 
Dear God, thank you for giving us what we need. Thank you for giving us life and the sunshine and people who love us and our daily food. We would come to you like those lepers did, seeking healing. We pray for baby Luca. Put your hand upon him that he might be blessed and be brought back to health. And put your hand on us that we might have grateful hearts and know that our cups overflow. And hear us now as we pray once more the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay. Have a good time in Sunday school, Melania. Thank you, Lynn. And uh, you all know the Lord's Prayer, right? Okay. And uh, let's wave to Michael. Thank you, Michael. Okay. We're going to sing another verse of... Come ye thankful people, come, I invite you to rise. Please be seated. So this Sunday we got uh, three different themes that are a part of this day. One is Thanksgiving. We are approaching Thanksgiving Thursday. And we want to open our hearts to the gift of God's love and all the ways in which we have been blessed. We are also, however, this morning talking a little bit about stewardship in so far as, thanks to a benevolent donor, all of your stewardship letters with a, a pledge card will be put in the mail and you'll be receiving it. And you are invited to bring it next Sunday or send it in. But we wanna ask, what is it that moves us to, to want to be faithful stewards of the gift of our church? And the third theme, this is what's called Christ the King Sunday, which is the last Sunday in the liturgical calendar. Uh, anybody know what next Sunday is in the liturgical calendar? Advent. Advent, which is always the beginning of the liturgical calendar. At the end of the liturgical calendar, we lift up the fact that Jesus is the King, even though it might seem often like the world doesn't recognize that kingship, which is absolutely true, but he is the king, the one to whom we are accountable. And this morning, as a part of Christ the King Sunday, we hear a strange story in that regard. We are brought back now into the Gospel of John. We've been in the Gospel of Mark, and this story comes from the point at which Jesus has been arrested he's been beaten up uh, and now he has been brought to Pilate the Roman governor and uh, it's Pilate has to decide whether he's going to die because uh, the Jewish people had no authority to execute somebody in the Roman Empire only uh, the Roman governor did and that's what those who've handed him over are trying to have happen. So listen now for the word of the Lord as it comes to us 
in the 18th chapter of the Gospel of John, beginning in the 33rd verse. Then Pilate entered the headquarters, again summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, Pilate went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him. Thus ends the reading of the scripture. May the Lord bless our hearing of the word. So, last week, Sarah and I celebrated our 28th wedding anniversary. I, I didn't know that would get applause, but thank you. Uh, and we were, we were remembering our honeymoon, which was a wonderful time. We drove through New England to look at the fall foliage, and we stayed at seven different bed and breakfasts in the course of a week. It was a wonderful time. As we were thinking about it, though, I suddenly had this strange realization, which was I could not remember how we possibly planned this. I mean, it was before we had the internet, at least the kind of internet we know today. today. Today, it's a relatively simple thing. You go online, you find all the bed and breakfasts in New England, you chart out a course, you make reservations. Pretty simple. I couldn't remember how we did it, which was kind of astonishing in and of itself. I, I came to, we must have had a book that had all the bed and breakfasts of New England in it, but we don't have any book like that. So to the life of me today, I still don't know how we planned that, which is just sort of telling in regard to how dramatically changed our life is as a result of the internet, right? You know, I can't, we can't really remember what that life was like before that. Now, the, the internet is obviously the source of a lot of helpful things. Uh, it's so convenient, you know, to be able to plan something like that online, and it's so convenient to be able to just access pretty much any kind of information we would want. Last week, if you were with me in the children's sermon, I noted that Jesus said, God's eye is on the sparrow. And I asked the question, well, how many sparrows are in the world? And all I had to do is a little Google search, how many sparrows are there on the world? And, and instantaneously, I got the answer, 1.6 billion sparrows. How do I know that 1.6 billion is a good answer? Well, I do because the people who provided that answer are bird scientists who devote their life to studying the birds. And I know that they have a whole lot better basis upon which to make an estimate of how many birds in this world. So I trust them to know approximately at least how many birds there are. But that points out an interesting fact that we so easily overlook, which is the vast majority of the knowledge that we have is not based on first-hand experience. It's based on experts that we trust. I trust that somebody who studies the birds for a living can come up with a better answer than I can. Though I myself have no clue how many birds there are. But what, what happens when the questions we're asking are a whole lot more complicated than, say, how many birds are there in the world? 
And what when uh, different experts who have different values and come from different biases and ask different questions come to distinctly different answers about a question and disagree? What then? What are we to make of that fact? If you go out on the internet, you can find what, in the absence of anybody offering a contrary argument, a seemingly reasonable argument to back up the proposition that the Earth is flat or that the moon landing didn't really happen, it was staged in a studio in Hollywood, or that the, the Twin Towers was an inside job. You'll find reasonable arguments by seeming experts. I don't believe those to be true, but I'm simply making the point that I don't know by first-hand experience that that's not true. I know because I place my trust in certain experts and not others which uh, begins to point to what I would suggest is a dark underbelly of the internet. Uh, Sarah and I watched this, uh, this uh, documentary a while back, which was about the big data companies. You know, Google and Facebook being the two biggest of the data companies. They make money by knowing stuff about us collecting data about us. This data is about what catches our attention. What are we interested in? It also is things about like what are our political points of view. And we get on the internet after a little while, they quickly figure out who we are. And if you are a liberal, what that means is that they begin to provide you with almost exclusively uh, articles that come from a liberal point of view because that's what you're interested in, that's what will get your attention. And if you are a conservative, they will give you articles that come from a conservative point of view. What does that mean? That means we all end up living in echo chambers, hearing what we already believe to be true back over and over to us. That means that this division that tears us apart gets deepened and deepened by the big data companies who are what? Looking to make money off of us because that's what they sell is the capacity to capture our attention. And that's kind of a scary thing. Uh, one of the things they found pretty early on, for instance, that will catch your attention faster than anything else is moral outrage. So if they can get you outraged, beginning with the assumptions of what it is that will out bring outrage to you, nothing will quite capture your attention like that. And so the big, the big data companies are, for the sake of profit, fostering the fires that division, divide us. The devil is referred to as the father of lies. Uh, what this might suggest is that all that animosity we develop, because when all you see, all the articles that appear to you about particular issues come from your point of view, then it, the conclusion you can't help but, but come to is that people who disagree with you are A, stupid, and B, morally bankrupt. And that's not actually true. The father of lies isn't so much necessarily with those who disagree with us, but those who are manipulating us for the sake of profit. It's a kind of a scary situation. And it uh, makes truth kind of elusive, and it tears us deeper and deeper apart. So, with this little background, I found it really striking, our passage this morning, how relevant it is to where we find ourselves at this moment in time. You know, 2,000 years ago, this story takes place in which uh, a group of people 
have arrested Jesus, they are convinced that he's a bad guy. Why? Because he's threatening their power. They're absolutely convinced he's a bad guy. They bring him to Pilate because they don't have the authority to execute him. Now, Pilate is not coming from where they are, so he has some greater sense of objectivity about the question, and he senses that they're not, uh, they're not necessarily grounded in reality. Uh, when he presses them about what is it that this guy has done, they just get madder and yell, he's a criminal. Anybody can see that, uh, which is interesting. Um, but Pilate recognizes that's not necessarily the case. So he goes to Jesus. He wants to get another point of view. He wants P Jesus to tell him what's really going on here from his point of view. Interestingly, though, Jesus doesn't really want to defend himself. He doesn't, he doesn't seem concerned about trying to change the points of view of others. He provides no counter-argument. He's not interested in creating a greater divide here. Um, he, he says simply, everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice, which I take to mean that if you have a humble spirit that is sincerely in quest of the truth, then the truth that I express will be self-evident. But if you don't have that humble spirit, nothing I can say to you will make any difference. So, it's clear that Pilate comes to the conclusion that Jesus really hasn't done anything wrong. He's an innocent man, which you might think would lead to him being released. But he doesn't release him. Why? Because Pilate has another concern. And that is, even though he's the most powerful man in the region, the governor of Judea, serving on behalf of the emperor. He's accountable to the emperor, off in Rome. And the emperor in Rome doesn't care much about the guilt or innocence of some individual far off in Palestine. What the, governor, what the emperor is concerned about is keeping things calm. He doesn't like rebellions. His commitment is a rebellion. He has to send more troops does not like that. And Pilate senses that if he doesn't turn Jesus over to them to be executed, well, he's got a rebellion, a riot on his hands. And uh, the emperor's not going to like that. So that's the bottom line. Can't let there be a rebellion. Sends him to be executed. Which is sort of similar to the big data companies. It'd be nice to be able to do the right thing, but profit, profit would be jeopardized. And profit is the bottom line. So we're going to keep on dividing people because it makes us richer and our stockholders. Strangely, eerily similar, don't you think? And so Pilate's cynical what is truth statement uh, is eerily akin to where we find ourselves. It's hard to know what the truth is. What is the truth that Jesus testifies to, has come to testify to? Well, I would suggest to you it's not the kind of truth or falsehood of are there 1.6 billion sparrows in this world? Or even necessarily the truth of what's the best social policy in the light of the pandemic, as important as that question is, rather the truth that Jesus witnesses to is the truth of his life, which witnesses to this love that undergirds all of us and connects us all. That Jesus is the divine logos out of which God created all human beings, and we are all connected in him if we see him as he is. He, it's not about the truth of a, quote, religion or a set of laws or dogmas. The only 
commandment Jesus has is love one another as I have loved you. That's the truth. And that's what Jesus calls people to see. And interestingly, the, the word, the Greek word that in this passage is translated truth, the actual literal meaning of it is to unforget. The implication being that this is a truth that we all know deep down inside, that love knits us all together, and that what the big data companies are doing, pulling us about, is bad. We really are connected. And whenever it, we, we look at people who disagree with us as somehow less than fully human, demonize them, we are betraying that truth with which we were made by God that endows each one of us with a sacred, eternal value. And to diminish them is to betray the truth. To betray the truth. So, circling back, why is it important for the church to be here? Well, it's because the world will lead you away from that truth that in the depths of your being you know but you forget because the internet and all those other sources lead you to 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 feel hostile and have your life defined by your hatreds of others because the internet and so much more will stroke that part of yourself that says i don't have enough i don't have enough be anxious be scared clutch to what you have, don't share. These are the lies that the world teaches us. And I would suggest to you, one way of understanding what we're about as the church is every week and hopefully in between, we get reconnected to that truth that deep down inside we know. That people all matter. That those things the world tells us so important about aren't so important as our souls, and our souls are related to our capacity to recognize the love that is the thing that matters, and to recognize that we really all are connected, no matter the outward differences. And we are the, the voice together that keeps you connected to that truth that is so critical, particularly in this time where Pilate speaks for us all in wondering what the truth is because there's so much falsehood intentionally peddled that wants to pull us apart. It is so important for us. So when you make out your pledge card, I just invite you to remember it. We're here to keep each other from losing our souls, losing our soul self into that illusion that is being peddled of deceit about what really matters and how human beings matter. The truth is a person, Jesus. And where do we find that person? Well, if we look deeply enough in every single person we encounter. Please pray with me. Oh, loving God, your spirit would set us free from the lies that divide us. We thank you for Jesus, who is truth. Help us to keep turning back to your son. Help us to allow him to remind us what is true. Help us to come back to the love he has revealed. Help us to faithfully be your church. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn. Is, o praise to thee, for thou, O King divine. Verses 1 and 2. Please rise.
Please be seated. So this is the symbolic time in our service where we hold the offering. I want to thank all of you and those, those of you at home, those of you who are present who have so faithfully supported our shared ministry of remembering truth and uh, witnessing to this love that has been revealed to us in Jesus, our crucified and risen Savior. Uh, what we do together is critically important, and thank you for your support with your financial gifts and your prayers. This is the time in our service where we pray together, which is so important. And once more, I'll be pausing for us to try to get in touch with our joy, our gratitude, once we let go of our anxieties I'll pause for God's spirit to descend into our hearts and our bodies, into our deepest need, trusting God to know that. And I will pause also for us to share our concerns for others or for ourselves for which we would seek the prayer of one another. Let us pray together. In the stillness, O oh God, we meet you again with the still small voice that calls us back to ourselves, awakens us from our slumber, calls us out of our illusions, calls us back home to you. And as we come back to you, we are aware that we are blessed, that in spite of the troubles and the problems, our cup does overflow. That simply to be alive in this great miracle and mystery that is life with so much beauty and love is a distinct privilege that you have invited us to receive. We thank you for life and for life shared through love. We thank you for those who have witnessed to the deep underlying love in small and big ways in our lives. Family members who've cared for us, friends who've been there for us, for this church and the ways in which we support one another in our frailty. We thank you for forgiveness when we stumble. We thank you for new beginnings. We thank you for those who've laughed with us when we needed someone to laugh with and those who've wept with us when we needed someone to share our grief. And we thank you for those opportunities you've given us to step out of the prison cell of our own little egos in love for others. We thank you for those moments of grace that have allowed us to put our trust in you beyond all the other voices that would call us to give our trust. And in that, we have been able to begin to let go of the tight grip of our anxieties and fears and sense your presence with us. We thank you for bravery in all the forms we have witnessed in these challenging times. We thank you for healings of body and spirit. I thank you that Karen Wilk this week had successful eye surgery, and now she can see so much better. Thank you for all the ways we've been healed, the ways we recognize, and the ways we are oblivious to. I thank you for the beauty of the earth and the harvest. I thank you for music that stirs us in the depths of our being. Lord, in your goodness, hear our prayers. 
Uh, Shelley shares that they are so thankful for Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, for his love and grace in, his, in their lives. Betsy Adams is grateful for people's prayers for her family. Joanne has a joy that she got to spend time with Julianne and Ken celebrating her big birthday this week. Can I share? Well, you shared it on Facebook. Joanne turned 70 this week, although you would never know it. <laughs> um, and I have a joy that this week we got to finally have our first choir rehearsal after going on two years. It was a joy to see everybody uh, come out, and we had a really good time singing together, so we can't wait to sing in church in a few weeks. Thank you, O oh God, for these gifts. Thank you for the opportunities that some of us will have this week to be with family and friends to give thanks. Thank you for the legacy of those who came before us, who persevered in holding on to the faith in spite of all that seemed to be against them. Thank you for this faith, this faith in Jesus, our crucified and risen Savior and the love that holds us. That love that holds us even when we are quite aware that we aren't fully whole yet, that there's bondage in our life. There are ways in which we aren't free to fully receive your love, to share your love. Oh Lord, you know our hearts, you know our bodies, you know our spirits vastly better than we know ourselves. You know what we need. And in this moment of silence, we would ask for your spirit to descend once more into our hearts, minds, and bodies, to meet us at that place of our deepest need. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you for this gift of breath. Thank you for that nudge to let go into your arms. And thank you for that call and claim on us to be instruments of your love, vessels of your spirit. Thank you for prayer. And we would raise up into your everlasting light and love the persons and situations that are on our hearts. We pray for Betsy and Paul's family. We pray for Pete and little Ben who are struggling with COVID and for Paula caring for them. And pray also for Ben's, for Pete's sister, Johanna, who has been dealing with brain cancer and this week after Thanksgiving will undergo surgery. Lord, pour out your spirit upon them and comfort Betsy and Paul in their sense of helplessness. We pray also for Anna Crystal's mother, Muriel, who she loves so in the nursing home, whose Alzheimer's disease is worsening and the sense of recognition disappearing. Bless Anna and Muriel. We pray also for Diane Anderson and Charlie Kinsley, Barbara Simmons' friend Anita, and Donna's brother-in-law, Phil. Pray for my brother-in-law, Bobby, who as a result of COVID is waiting for a kidney transplant to save his life. Pray also for Tom Albert's mom and Tom as he cares for her. For Connie's son, Jonathan, for Tim and Anna and June Snetzer and Len Bostwick, Joris and Fred, for Watchan, 
is grateful for a good medical test, for ongoing healing for Karen and Angela and Steve Bryant, Hetal, Cheryl, Paul's parents, Len's friend Cheryl, Shelley's friend Jan, Garrett's housemate Thomas, Amy Deeks, Aunt Marilyn, Diane Morgan, Fawaz's friend O, recovering from brain surgery, for those dealing with homelessness, for George Haddad and Gina Treza, I pray also for Gina's son Nick and his three-year-old son Avian in the challenging circumstances of their lives, for all those living on the streets, all those fearful of losing their homes, for all those grappling with cancer and the fear that arises. We pray for all those who continue to suffer from the pandemic, suffering in so many different ways, grief, isolation, sickness, depression. We pray for mindfulness, for the capacity to live more fully in the present mindful of the ways we impact one another, mindful of our connection to one another, both physically and spiritually. Help us, O oh God, to be bearers of your peace, your healing, your reconciliation, your hope. We pray for all who grieve. We pray for our earth and pray for those who are suffering from flooding and forest fires and the poorest who will suffer from climate change. Help us, O oh Lord, to be better stewards of the gift of this earth. We pray for the littlest of your people, overlooked people, unseen perhaps in our own neighborhood, people in Afghanistan, people in Haiti, people at the borderline people who struggle with decisions to be made that are in positions of authority. Empower them, O oh Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Prayers for our friend Sarah Bush, whose mother passed away and their funeral was yesterday. Prayers for Anna Weiss, who is having bad leg cramps. Uh, Connie asks continued prayers for Jonathan for complete healing of his ear. Mady asks prayers to Ryan, who was having dizzy spells, so he didn't come to church today. Joanne asks prayers for her brother Larry and wife Susan as they deal with heat and hot water problems. Shelley asks prayers for their local jail chaplain, Pastor Mark, who is having health struggles. And Anna and Bob Lau asked prayers for brother-in-law Mike, who was recently diagnosed with lymphoma. God, we raise up these cares, and we ask that you would bless that mustard seed of faith within us, that we might truly know that you are holding all these needs in your everlasting love. You are at work in ways we cannot imagine. And we ask that we ourselves may be the answer to somebody else's prayer, that we might be attentive to that nudge of your spirit that leads us to reach out in compassion, to share your joy, to share your love with somebody who needs to be reassured that they are precious in your sight. We pray all of this in the name of our Savior, our crucified and risen Lord, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Our final <clears throat> hymn is the third verse of all praise to thee for thou, O King divine, I invite you to stand.
Please be seated. And before the final, final benediction, we pause for announcements pertaining to the life of our church. There is indeed coffee hour in person today as well as on Zoom. We're grateful for Tom Albert and Catherine and Jean. There are going to be stewardship letters, as I mentioned, sent out to you this week with a pledge card inside. I invite you to prayerfully consider your financial support of the church and the importance of our shared ministry together and to either bring your pledge card back to worship next Sunday or to mail it into the church that we might plan for our coming ministry in the year 2022. There is opportunity to connect online this week, Tuesday, with Joanne at 2 o'clock. Um, Betsy usually meets on Fridays at 2, but she will not meet this week because of Thanksgiving holiday. I offer guided meditation on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Won't be offering that on Thursday this week, but will be on Wednesday. The choir is, as Barb shared, once more rehearsing, but they won't be doing that on Thanksgiving either. But you are welcome after that to join in rehearsals. And also the Motley Crew Christian Band that will play once more next Sunday. We invite all newcomers. And amazingly, as I mentioned, we're about to enter Advent next Sunday, and so we will have the tradition of the Hanging of the Greens next Saturday, beginning at 11 o'clock. All are welcome who would like to share in decorating our church for Advent and Christmas. Once more, we want to connect those who need someone to shop for them uh, with people who are quite willing to do so. Let us know if you have such a need. And I also thank you for your support of my pastor's discretionary fund. And if you are in need financially in a situation, emergency situation, please reach out to me. Uh, once more, I thank you for your ongoing support, your offerings, and all the ways you support our shared ministry. Any other announcements today? All right. Please rise for the final benediction. Go forth into this world with a heart that is open to the bounty of God's grace. Go forth to trust in that grace, that love that reveals to us just how deeply knit together we all are through Jesus. Help us to go and bear witness through the ways we live, the words we share, to the deepest truth, the truth of Jesus. In his name, amen. Thank <laughs> you.